visible fine let me just If any anything gets cut off, please let me know. Okay. So welcome to lecture two of quantum computation. In uh, the first lecture, I just gave you a brief overview of uh, computation in general, and uh, you know went over some things which I presume that all of you are already familiar with, such as logic gates, uh, truth tables, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we talked about, can everybody hear me? Yes. Do I need to be loud? Then we talked about limits of computation, theoretical and physical. Theoretical, uh, physical limits are placed by uh, the laws of thermodynamics and the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, so, and one of those principles is known as Landauer's principle. I hope that you all have understood this. If you have not, you can please ask me again, I can clarify it. Basically says that if you want to erase any information, you have to increase the entropy of the outside world. Uh, because you're decreasing the entropy of this system. So the entropy of the outside world must increase to compensate. And since the entropy of the outside world increases, that corresponds to a transfer of heat from the system to the outside world. So erasure always corresponds to the generation of heat. And uh, then I uh, talked about the concept of entropy and how it is related to the compressibility of information, okay? So we will we will talk more about uh, entropy and compression and all of these these concepts uh, later on. Today I want to get started uh, uh, talking about. Uh, so so we have we have these limits, right? So the question is, how how far can we push these limits? Right. So, because that ultimately will determine uh, how powerful our, our processing machines can be. So, well, another another li limit which belongs in the this theoretical limit category. And so what are, what are the theoretical limits on, on computation? So you might think that, well, okay, let's say that I have infinite resources. I don't care about the generation of heat from my device. Um, and I have uh, communication between different components, which is, you know, takes place at the speed of light without any dissipation. I have superconducting circuits and everything. So then the question is, are there any, any theoretical limits on what you can actually compute, right? And the answer turns out to be that, well, that depends on the question that you're asking. And so this was explored in the early 19th, uh, early 20th century by people, two people primarily and others, but the ones who are uh, relevant for this topic are Kurt Gödel and Alan Turing. So Turing in particular is, is, is famous for the construction of something called a Turing machine. So the Turing machine is the first model of a universal computer, right? So for instance, your PC or your laptop or your cell phone, these are all universal computers, right? What is a universal computer? 
So in the Turing machine model, you have a tape and there is a there is a head some something that can write information on this on this tape so this tape keeps moving past this uh, this this head and what the head does is it reads whatever is written on the on the on the you know the what do you call it on the slot right and then it performs some operation that operation could depend on whatever has gone on before right whatever has passed by before and then it can either write something on this on this you know change what is there it can erase it or it can let it be or it can come to a halt okay so halt is so for instance you can program your tape for instance to do a, a calculation right so your calculation could be uh, could be a question of the following form right is n prime right so now you have various algorithms for determining if if a number is a is prime right what is a prime number it doesn't have any um, it so if it if it can be if it cannot be written if it doesn't have any prime factors right if it is not divisible by any number other than one in itself, it's a prime number. So one very simple algorithm for determining whether n is a prime number is just to um, take numbers from one to let's say n by two, right? And then ask if n is divisible by any one of these numbers, <coughs> right? If it is, then you say not prime and halt. If it is no, then you continue the for loop, right? And if this for loop terminates without printing this not prime, then it's a prime number, then you say fault, right? So this is, this is a typical example of a sort of a question that one might want. So I just want to ask the people on Zoom, are you all able to um, hear me clearly enough? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If there is any difficulty, please let me. So this is a typical example of a question that one might want to ask a, a, a computer. And so such a problem goes by the general name of a halting, halting problem. Meaning that your program, right? Whatever your question is, so is it possible to write uh, a program which can always come to a halt, right? Which can always give you a definite yes or no answer, right? So for instance, whether n is prime, you should, you will always get a true or false answer, right? But what, what the, what Kurdel showed, right? Gödel is famous for showing something known that goes by the name of undecidability. Gödel's undecidability principle, which is a statement that there exist 
propositions. Okay. Now, in order to prove this, in order to you know make these statements, Gödel used a certain form of logic, uh, which is known as uh, this predicate logic, and there, there's a certain symbolic language known as the lambda calculus. All of this is like not necessary. Uh, you know, you don't have to sit down and, and learn the lambda calculus. This is just for historical background. But this lambda calculus, basically, in, in this, you can take any proposition such as this, that n is prime. Okay? That's a proposition. And then you can write it using a bunch of symbols. Okay. I believe this is known as first order logic. There are all kinds of different kinds of logic and I'm by no means an expert on this. But what, what Gödel showed is that there exist propositions which are true, but, uh, but for whom There does not exist any way to determine whether they are true. Okay. Now, obviously such propositions, let me try to make my writing, but for whom, there does not exist any way to determine, right? So there, there are questions that one can ask, which you can build out of this language of predicate logic, which are true, but there is no algorithm that one can write, right? Which will allow you to determine whether the proposition is true or not, right? So the reason Gödel uh, was asking this question is because prior to, to Gödel, there were two people. One was Bertrand Russell and the other was Alfred Whitehead. Right? So mathematics had made a lot of you know, strides over the past several centuries. And people started to come to the uh, belief that mathematics could answer any question, right? You just had to uh, know how to pose the question and mathematics, you know, there would always be some way to solve that problem. And so what Russell and Whitehead, they, they tried to do is they tried to axiomatize all of mathematics. Okay. And so in order to do this, they, uh, they had some ridiculously complicated uh, language that they wrote all, all of their, their propositions in. So Gödel looked at this question, right? And his result basically showed that what Russell and Whitehead were trying to achieve was an empty, uh, was, was just a illusion, right? Because, because there is a big gaping hole. You cannot, you, you can never in any system of axioms, as an example, you can consider Euclid's geometry. Right? In Euclidean geometry, there are certain axioms. So one of the axioms, for instance, is that is called the parallel line axiom. There are, there are several other axioms which I don't remember. But this axiom says that if you have a line and a point which doesn't lie on that line, 
then you can always draw a unique line through this point, which is parallel to the first. <coughs> okay. And there are a bunch of other axioms, which, which are, uh, there, are, there are five of them or something like that. So the offshoot of Gödel's result, right? Is that in any form of, in any axiomatic system, it could be Euclidean geometry, it could be number theory, it could be anything else. In any axiomatic system, there will exist statements. So for instance, in this, there will be some statements about Euclidean geometry, which are true, but which are not provable using the axioms. Um, can I please request you to join us in the online? More. Well, right now, right. It's it's like those apocalyptic movies, right? Where where you like you know, like somebody's like sweating a little bit. And then you like mark that person and put them in a cage. And unfortunately, we are very much close to being in that scenario right now. Though, of course, it's only a matter of a few more weeks. That is until the next virus comes up. Don't worry, Gopi Anevala. Now, now you have things called CRISPR, which can uh, make almost any genetic. Uh, pattern that you want, fun times. So coming back to this, so why am I talking about all this? Like, I mean, what does all this have to do with quantum computation? It's because quantum computation shows us a way to go beyond all of these results of classical mathematics, right? So, so these, these are theoretical limits to what is possible, right? That in any axiomatic system, there exist propositions which are true, but not provable within that system of axioms. And then Turing showed, right? He constructed this, this you know, imaginary object. Well, not imaginary because he actually built this, right? In the form of computers, uh, which, broke the Enigma code, by the way. This is interesting viewing for anybody who cares. Enigma was a, um, was a code that was used by, in World War II by the Nazis. It was used to communicate with their U-boats and their U-boats meaning the submarines were very successful in going and sinking uh, allied uh, ships. So until Enigma was broken, the allies were in, in, in trouble. But once Enigma was broken, right, the tables turned very quickly because uh, the British and Americans could intercept these messages, right? And from that point on, Hitler's U-boats, right, the submarine warfare was ineffective. So that was a big deal. And Enigma was broken by a team that was led by Alan Turing. Right? I had a place called Blackley, Blackley Park or something like that. So there are a lot of movies about it. Then uh, Alan Turing also turned out to be gay. And in those days, um, Britain was, and the world was not really as enlightened as it is now. And ultimately, he committed suicide by eating a poisoned apple because of various restrictions that were placed on him. So this is the father of all modern computation, who played a decisive role in, in, in turning the tide of World War II, but, when, but was then led to his own death by his own people. Anyways, so... Then we come to, to another limit, 
Okay, so so this thing, these limits might seem very abstract because because you might say, well, sure there are such axioms, but what do they matter, right? I mean, what I really want to do, what I really want to what care about, for instance, is is predicting uh, weather patterns, right? I want to predict whether a hurricane will form in Kansas or whether uh, uh, you know. Uh, a uh, well, a tornado will form in Kansas, or a hurricane will form in the Bay of Bengal. That is what I care about, right? Or to predict the path of such a. So, so the real question is, um, if you have a very complicated system, such as uh, a hurricane or a tornado, or uh, an ocean or a biosphere, the real question is. What are the computational resources required to simulate the evolution of such a system, right? So what is the complexity of any problem? And uh, what are the resources required to, to tackle that problem, right? So there is, um, there, there, there are different classes of problems they are uh, in in classical computation they fall into two categories well there are many categories there are subcategories of these and so on and so forth but there are two primary categories one is p which stands for polynomial and np which stands for non polynomial what does this mean Polynomial and non-polynomial in what? In n, where n is the size of the of the system in question that you are trying to model, right? So if you have a gas with n particles, for instance, right, and you want to model the the evolution of this gas, you want to track the positions and momenta of each of the of the gas particles right and you write some code to do that how does that code scale with n right this is what matters because if your code doesn't scale polynomially with n right so polynomially with n means means that the size of your code goes as order of n to some power at the maximum, right? So it is polynomial in n, meaning it can go as n squared, n cubed, or n log n or something like that. Non-polynomial means that the size of your program scales as something like e to the n, right? So it's clear that if a problem lies in this category, then uh, we there there's, there is a good chance that we can we can solve it, we can tackle it, right? It might require a large amount of resources, but at least theoretically, it is something that we can deal with. But if a problem lies in NP, then we are basically screwed. Right, because you know, the moment you increase your system size, the resources required will will blow up exponentially. So there is a very famous conjecture in mathematics, which is that p is not equal to np. Recently, somebody has uh, claimed to have proven it, but uh, there is there is debate about this. So people are not convinced that, well, the, you know, is it true that, for instance, that P is strictly a subset of NP, right? So NP should include all the problems which are of polynomial uh, scale in the size of the system, right? Because NP is the bigger class. Uh, so the question is, is P in, NP or is P not equal to NP, right? 
So anyway, so th these are some, some labels that one gives to, to problems. Now, all of this is fine, right? Until we come to quantum mechanics. And this is where things become very difficult. Right? So almost all the problems that, that we are interested in dealing with, there exist algorithms which uh, are in this class P. Okay? And that is the reason why we are able to do any effective kind of prediction and simulation at all. Right? Whether it be cosmological simulation, structure formation, geological simulation, um, but the, the, the study of protein folding, for instance, or any, any, such, uh, any such difficult problem. But when it, when it comes to quantum mechanics, we, we, we suddenly run into a big, big problem, which is the fact that Hilbert space is big. Okay. And what, what, is, what is the meaning of this statement? What is Hilbert space? Hilbert space is basically where all the quantum states live, right? So in quantum mechanics, we describe the state of a system as an element of a vector space, okay? So this notation, this is called a ket. So you would pronounce this as ket psi. This is the Greek letter psi. And this is H, curly H. That is our Hilbert space, our vector space. And later on, we will also meet another object, which is called, which are called bra vectors. So you would call it bra phi. And this is called the bracket or Dirac notation. Now, unfortunately, Dirac, uh, the person who came up with this terminology was not socially very, um, how shall we say it, um, adept. So we are we are we are stuck with this very awkward sort of. But uh, in any physics course, we soldier on and work with it. Work with what we are given with. Okay. So, all right. So we have we have states, and these states are elements of vectors. Now, what is a vector space? What is a vector? You're all familiar with something like this, right? A vector is a collection of components like this. Right? In general, a vector can have n components. And we would say that this is an n-dimensional vector, right? These vectors, these components can be real numbers, they can be complex numbers, they can be integers, right? And there, there are other uh, more uh, uh, esoteric objects which are, which are known as fields. So you can have uh, something called, called ZK, which is a finite field. We'll, if the need arises, we'll talk about these things. But for now, this is enough. So for instance, if your vector components take values in R, right? This, so what, are, what is R? R is the set of real numbers. C is the set of complex numbers. Z is a set of integers, right? So please remember this notation. Set of real numbers, complex numbers, set of integers, set of natural numbers, 
and we won't really be using any others, okay? So if I have a vector with, uh, which has three components and these components each can be a real number, let's say, what can such a vector describe, right? This vector can describe, for instance, the position of a point, right, in 3D space, right? What is 3D space? It's the space of around us, right? Cartesian space, X, Y, Z. And so we would say that V is an element of R cross R cross R, right? Because this is a tuple. This is a set of three real numbers, right? So whenever you have two sets and I have set A and set B, right? And I can take elements of set A and elements of set B, right? And put them together into one object. This is an element of A cross B. It basically, A cross B means the set of all pairs of objects with the first object from the set A and the second from the set B. So R cross R cross R means pairs of three real numbers. You would also write this as R cubed. Okay. In more examples of this, we will uh, have to, you know, we will encounter other such such a notation. So let me tell you what, what they are. S1 stands for a circle. Okay. Not the inside of a circle, only the boundary. S2 stands for the surface of a sphere. Okay. So this is S1, S2, so the set of all the points on the surface of a sphere would be described by S, right? This is just some notational uh, preliminaries that I'm getting out of the way. And uh, so, so vectors, coming back to vectors, you can also have vectors which are complex numbers, which have complex components. And so in this case, we would say that V, for instance, belongs to C3, right? And what are complex numbers? For the sake of completeness, uh, let me just very briefly tell you what complex numbers are. They are numbers of the form X plus IY, where I is formally written as a square root of minus one, I square is minus one. With these numbers, there are certain operations that you can perform. One is complex conjugation. Under complex conjugation, I goes to minus I. So each such complex number is associated to a point in two dimensional Cartesian space. And each complex number can also be written as R e to the I theta. Now, most of you, if not all of you know all of this being engineers, but it's better to just get this out of the way rather than to have any of you be lost and confused along on later on. So here R is called the, uh, the modulus. It can also be written as Z times the square root of Z times Z constant, right? Which is equal to X square plus Y square square root. And theta is this angle, right? So theta is tan inverse Y by X, right? And then using Euler's formula, we can write this as cosine theta plus I sine theta. And so Z can be written as R cosine theta plus I R sine. So any complex number, any complex number C 
is equal to having a pair of real numbers, right? R cross R, because there is one real number and one real number, right? So for instance, if I write C cubed over here, this is also the same, I could also say, this is R cubed, right? Not, not strictly because there is additional structure in this complex number space, which is not present in R cubed, sorry, R6, I could say. Okay, so, so we have these, these, these states, these states are vectors, right? They're vectors in a Hilbert space. And what is this Hilbert space? It's a complex vector space. Okay. It can either be finite dimensional or infinite dimensional. But in quantum computation, we will deal almost exclusively with finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So you can rest rest easy on in that uh, in that uh, regard. Now, so Hilbert space is big, right? What do we mean by when we say Hilbert space is big? Well, again. So these are all just very elementary facts about linear algebra, for instance. Right? So linear algebra tells us that any vector space can have, has a set of basis vectors. Right? And the set of basis vectors is not unique. So for instance, when I say, uh, when I write something like this, V is equal to V1, V2, V3, I can equally well write this as V1 right? as a linear combination of three vectors where E1 is the vector with components one, zero, zero, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, like this, right? So these are three vectors. I can take a linear combination of these vectors, right? So this is a linear combination. This concept of linear combination actually is precisely what will turn out to be what we refer to as superposition of quantum states. Okay, so superposition of quantum states is really nothing more than linear uh, addition of vectors. What else can we do with vectors? We can uh, take the dot product of vectors, right? So on. Uh, but there is a small issue, which is that our states are complex vectors. Now, if they are complex vectors, uh, then there is a small complication because remember that you can take u dot u, right? What does this give you? This gives you u square. This is what we normally refer to as the length squared, right? of a vector. Yes, now, in quantum mechanics, it will turn out to be the case that this length square, this thing, will correspond to the probability of, will correspond to probabilities. It will correspond to some kind of a probability. And probabilities are real numbers. They are positive numbers, but they are also real numbers, right? One can have a theory of negative probability and so on. Feynman, if you Google that, you'll find Feynman has done some work on that. 
but those are just calculational tools. At the end of the day, any probabilities that you measure have to be positive real numbers, right? So the fact that the length squared of a vector has to be a probability and a real number uh, is, is, is what creates a problem for us because now let's say that u is a, these, these are complex vectors now, right? These are complex numbers. So if I take u dot u, right, my naive inner product, this is called the inner product, right? Also called the scalar product. We can cut off a little bit, but not too much. Is this a real number in general? If these are complex numbers, u1, u2, and u3, will this combination be a real number in general? No. Right? But there is a simple way in which I can get a real number out of a complex number. What is that? Right? Complex number multiplied by its complex conjugate gives me a real number. Right? So, again, because of this physically motivated reason, For a complex vector space, the one that we are interested in, u square should be defined in this way, right? u complex conjugate dotted with u. Okay. Right? If we do this, what will we get? We'll get u1 star u1, u2 star u2, right? Which will be a real number and it will also be a positive number so i i can write this as belongs to r plus are there any questions from the zoom side please ask if you have any and my laptop hopefully will not die in the remaining time let me just uh, close all other applications Yeah, I don't know how effective this will be, but let's hope that it does. Okay. All right. So, um, so we accept this as the definition of a the length of a vector. Okay. But if I accept this as a definition of the length of a vector, then I have a small problem. How should I define u dot v? Should I define it as u star dot v, right? Or u dot v star? Now there are two possibilities, right? Because this object, the length squared of u, it descends from the inner product, right? v dot u. So this inner product, now that I have taken a complex conjugate of one of these vectors, I have an option of putting this complex conjugate either on u or on v. There are two possibilities now. Which one of these should be my inner product, right? This is why Dirac introduced these two different kinds of vectors. The Kets, and the bras, or we can call them the adjoint kits. That is what I'll refer to them from now. Adjoint kits. 
What is the relationship between these two? You can think of a ket as a column vector. And an adjoint of this as a row vector with a complex conjugation to it. Right? So it is transpose complex conjugate. Okay? This operation of complex conjugate transpose is something we will be using on a very, very regular basis. And it is referred to as an Hermitian adjoint. And you can do this for vector, you can do it for matrices. So if you have, if you have a matrix AIJ, if you have a matrix A whose components are AIJ, then the components of the Hermitian adjoint will be given by AJI complex conjugate. Okay, so you can write this as A Hermitian adjoint IJ. So this is the IJ element of the matrix of the Hermitian adjoint. And this symbol is a dagger. It's not a plus sign, it's a dagger. So this is the blade and that is the hilt. <laughs> okay. This is the Hermitian adjoint. So if you write it, if you use this adjoint ket and ket notation, then we get a very simple and beautiful way of writing down the length squared of any vector. It is the inner product of the adjoint ket with the ket. Right? Remember the adjoint ket is what? U1 star, U2 star, UN star. And the ket is U1 un. So when I multiply these two, what do I get? I get u1 modulus squared till un modulus squared, which is the length of this vector squared. And I'm not going to put the vector sign on this anymore. I'm just going to refer to it as the length of this object. Okay. So Hilbert space, where we will spend all our time, is the space of complex vectors. Com so complex vectors with the positive definite inner product, positive definite inner product, which is defined as in this way. Okay. Now, let me give you some quick examples of Hilbert spaces that we care about. Let's consider an electron. Now, an electron has a internal degree of freedom that is known as spin, which behaves like angular momentum. Angular momentum is what happens when you take a ball and you set it spinning. This spin degree of freedom, it has two uh, possible states it can exist in, which are called the up state and the down state. for obvious reasons. These two states, we will also write in this way, ket zero and ket one. 
Alternatively, I can write it as get up and get down. Okay. So if I have the state of an electron or a state of a spin particle, a particle with spin, how would I write the general state? I would write it like this. I would write it as a linear superposition of these two possibilities. And why a linear superposition of these two possibilities? Because these possibilities are the result of any possible measurement. So when I take to perform a measurement on this, on this object, I'll only get two answers. I'll get either up or down, zero or one. No, no other answers. And these are my classically distinguishable outcomes. CDOs. This is a term, terminology that I have invented. I've not seen it in any other place. So classically distinguishable outcomes. I'm not going to write that down because it's too long. Should correspond to in the, in the vector space picture, right? What is the intuitive idea of when you say that two vectors have something in common? Right? If you have two vectors, let's say this is a vector u, how would I say that this vector and another vector v have nothing in common? Right? I would say that u dot v is zero. They have nothing in common, right? They are orthogonal. Right? And this is also very clear in a, in a physical sense, because if you write this in terms of some components, in some basis, U will have only certain non-zero components, and we will have only other non-zero components for different set of the basis factor. On the other hand, if U dot V is not equal to zero, then I say that they have something in common, right? Right? So in that case, U and V, I can project U down to V, right? And this projection would be measured by U dot V. So they have something in common. So I want my outcomes, my classical outcomes to be distinguishable. And if they have something in common, then they are not distinguishable. Right? Vinit, you are sitting here, Shantan, you are sitting there, you are distinguishable. So the, your state should be orthogonal to his state. Right? So what does that imply? If these are classically distinguishable outcomes, up and down, then this implies that they should be orthogonal to each other. Now, do you understand this notation that I have written down? What does this notation mean? Look at it very carefully and make sure that you understand what it means. Remember, this is the inner product of two vectors, right? One is a ket corresponding to the down state. The other is the adjoint ket corresponding to the up state. You can also write with the ket and adjoint ket switched. It won't change the orthogonality, right? Since these are, so my, my point is, since these are classically distinguishable outcomes, that means they have to be orthogonal. And since they are orthogonal, that means they have to be basis vectors. Right, because if you have a set of orthogonal basis vectors, that set of basis vectors forms a, sorry, if you have a set of orthogonal vectors, that set of vectors forms a basis for your vector space. So any state can be written, once I have a basis, any state can be written as a linear superposition of my basis vector. 
right? So this is my quantum state of a single spin one half particle. Why spin one half? Because well, why not spin two point six? Well, because these electrons they have angular momentum h bar by two. Okay. We will not go into great detail in the into the physics of everything, right? We are we're, this is a class on quantum computation, not a class on quantum mechanics. But you have to understand quantum mechanics. But what aspects of quantum mechanics? You have to understand single potential uh, particle in a box, harmonic oscillator, a hydrogen atom, and all. No. Well, harmonic oscillator probably at some later point. That's very important. But what you have to understand are the principles of quantum mechanics, which can be learned without looking at any of these problems. These are all infinite dimensional systems. Okay, we are looking at the simplest possible quantum system. This is the simplest possible vector space that one can have, right? There is no vector space which has less than two basis vectors. If there is a vector space with one basis vector, then well, all the vectors are identical up to scaling. So this is the state of a single spin. Okay. Now, in the remaining moments before my battery dies completely, let's talk about two such electrons because I want to end the class by explaining to you why is Hilbert space big, okay? So let's talk about two such spins, okay? Right? You have a single electron and you have another electron. The first electron is in the state psi one and the second electron is in the state psi. These are just vectors again, remember, right? Now, if I take a measurement of my system, if I measure the spins of my electrons, what are the possible outcomes? I can get up and up, up and down, down and up, down and down, right? These are the four possible outcomes that I can get, right? And these are my classically distinguishable outcomes, right? This outcome is classically distinguishable from this one, right? Because I know which spin is the left one, which one is the right one. So these two are also distinguishable. Since they are classically distinguishable outcomes, this implies that they are orthogonal to each other in term as vectors. So if I think of this as a vector, right? This is orthogonal to this object as a vector, right? And in fact, these are vectors. Because what this, what we are doing is we are taking something known as a tensor product. So what is, what is this tensor product? Tensor product is how you combine vector spaces. So if you have vector space for one system and a vector space for another system, I want to construct a vector space which describes the composite system. Right? Now in a quantum mechanics course, this would be something that I would maybe cover at the very end of the course or maybe not at all. But in quantum computation, it's the very first thing we have to do because it's the basis of all of quantum computation. So the tensor product is, what is it? Here I have a two dimensional space and I have a two dimensional space. If I take the tensor product, what is the dimensionality of this space? Four. If I take, if I have three vectors, what will be the dimensionality? 
and this is the symbol for a tensor product. This will be how many dimensions? A. If I take H n times, what will be the dimensionality? Two to the power n. Right. So if I have a state of n electrons, a quantum state of n qubits, right? This is what a qubit is, by the way. This is a qubit. It's a quantum bit. But there are two possibilities, up and down. A state of n qubits has how many components? How many components are there in that? It, remember, state is a vector. A vector lives in the Hilbert space. The Hilbert space of n qubits, how do I construct it? I take the tensor product of n copies. What is the dimensionality of this Hilbert space? Two to the n. So a state of n qubits has how many components? Two to the n components, right? Right? So the description of a quantum state of a system requires the amount of information that is required to specify the complete quantum state is exponential in the size of the system. So for instance, if I ask, if I have like, let's say this classroom and I say, what is the quantum state of this classroom? I look at all the particles in this classroom, right? How many are there? Well, let's just make a very naive estimate. One mole is 10 to the 23 atoms, right? Approximately Avogadro's number. So let's just take one mole of gas. According to at standard temperature and pressure, one mole of, uh, what is it? H2O is corresponds to one liter of water, right? So what is the quantum state of one liter of water? It corresponds to, to a state vector, which has how many components? Assuming that each molecule can be described by a, by a two dimensional state, okay? Which is not necessarily true, but we'll make that assumption. What is the dimensionality of, this, of that state? which is very large, right? It's a very definition of large. So this is what we mean when we say that there is a lot of room in Hilbert space. And this is a saying by <coughs> a very famous quantum information theorist called Carlton Caves. There is a lot of room in Hilbert space, which means that it's easy to get lost, right? Which means that if you have two different states of a large quantum system, it's very difficult to know, for instance, whether those two how to go from one state to another state. Or if you want to manipulate and, and control the state of a quantum system, right? how many degrees of freedom are you actually manipulating? You're not manipulating n degrees of freedom. You're manipulating some exponential to the nth power. Could be two to the n, depends on the dimensionality of the individual quantum state. Which brings us back to the question of complexity. Ah, you thought I would just let you go without telling you the punchline, right? Complexity brings us back to NP, non-polynomial. So the simulation of any quantum system 
is an NP hard problem. There is a technical term called NP hard. And no classical system right, can provide a simulation of a, of a quantum system. I mean, that's not completely true because, well, if I have a spin one half particle, I can always simulate that in complete generality on my computer, which is a classical system. But if I want to simulate a quantum system, which is the size of my computer, I would need a classical system, which is the size of the solar system. On the other hand, let's say that I have access to a machine, which is also quantum mechanical. I can use that quantum mechanical machine to model the quantum mechanical state of my system. So one quantum mechanical system can simulate another quantum mechanical system, right? Without having to go to the to extreme sizes. This is the origin of the idea of quantum computation. And this is due to several people. One of them is Feynman, another is David Deutsch. But the history of computation itself is very rich. There are many people who have contributed uh, to this. Alan Turing, Kurt Gödel, um, then Alonzo Church, um, Shannon, Claude Shannon. He made the most fundamental contributions to information theory. Um, then uh, there was a German mathematician called Konrad Zuse. There's a contemporary scientist called Jürgen Schmidt Huber. There is Seth Lloyd, Stephen Wolfram. All of these people, right, have contributed, and, and Roger Penrose also, who is a physicist, but who has thought very deeply about these ideas of computation, right? So, so why do we study quantum computation? For practical reasons and for also uh, not so practical reasons, right? To understand what are the very limits to, to our ability to model nature, right? And so this, this will also hopefully give us insight into what are the ultimate constituents of nature, right? And at a more pragmatic level, it greatly increases your employable uh, prospects for employment, right? I'll stop here for now because my battery is almost dead and I'll take any questions that you might have. No, absolutely not. This is a very good question. Uh, the form of the qubit can be the, it, many different types of uh, systems are there. One very uh, system that is very common right now is called a squid. It's called a superconducting uh, quantum interference device. It's basically a ring, a split ring in which there is a super superconducting current. There, there is some substance which is a superconductor and can oscillate either one way or another way, right? Something in a in a circle, right? It can go left, counterclockwise, or clockwise. It turns out that these two states are orthogonal to each other, and they form the qubit. So this forms a qubit. So these squid devices are uh, the most common form of uh, quantum computers in, in use today. But there are others, uh, uh, and another form of you know, computational device, which is called topological quantum computation, which holds much greater promise, but is much more technically challenging. So to answer your question, no. Electrons is just an example. In fact, electrons are not used at all directly in any quantum computational devices. 
right? The, uh, the whole idea is that information is physical, which means that the, I, you can take a state, right? And you can map it to various different kinds of physical systems. It could be an electron, it could be a Josephon junction in the form of a squid. Um, it, it can be an optical mode in, a, in an electromagnetic cavity. In electromagnetic cavity, you can have standing waves. Those can correspond to uh, different states can correspond to qubits. Uh, you can have the excited states of an atom. An atom can, you can put the, so there you have an electron as a degree of freedom, but the logical state is the, corresponds to whether the state is excited or no. So qubits come in very different, many, many different forms. And uh, again, our goal is not really, we won't be going into great detail into the physical implementation, right? Though we will discuss these things along the way. Okay, any other questions? Zoom people, any questions? If any of you are still there. Okay, so if there are no questions, then please remember that, look, if you want to get the most out of this course, read, okay? So the reading uh, that you should have been doing so far is uh, this, chapter one of uh, Nielsen and Chuang, okay? So everything that I've talked about is described oh, here, and here in, in, in beautiful language. You can also read uh, the uh, portions of Pascal's notes, okay? Of course, everything is not possible. So if you have to stick to one uh, text uh, from for a more pragmatic perspective, I would say, suggest Nielsen and Chuang uh, for a more theoretical and more advanced uh, perspective, I would suggest Preskill. Okay, and with that, I'll stop the recording.